Enough outside for you? Yeah. Well, thank you to those brave ones that uh, came out in negative eight with wind chill. Actually, the wind's calmed down a little bit, but thank you all for coming. And um, welcome to our online audience. Um, we're really excited about tonight's uh, presentation with uh, Dr. Uh, Youngberg. Um, let me just say a few words about him. I first heard him on Audioverse. Actually, it was a presentation you did with your parents. So your parents were missionaries, and I found out he's born in Chile. And uh, you said it's your aunt, was it? Great your great aunt that wrote uh, famous mission stories. So he really comes from a missionary bloodline, and I think that's in his DNA of being a missionary and serving. Uh, you've got a PhD in clinical nutrition, so you have a clinical nutritional uh, nutrition practice. And, uh, and, and so he's got a practice in San Diego in preventive medicine. He's also an associate professor at Loma Linda, uh, and I think two departments, you said, um, public health and preventative medicine. Um, and so we're, uh, and, and you've served as a missionary, uh, I, was, I was told, in Guam for 14 years. And so I think the mission and service is really uh, in your blood, and I know when COVID started, you were online and you had a lot of great uh, remedies and things that people could do to um, to boost their immune system. So we're really excited to have You want me to use this one? All right. Father in heaven, Thank you so much for being here with us. Thank you for all the people that have braved the cold weather outside. Uh, thank you for getting us here safely and please help us get back home safely. Lord, we invite your Holy Spirit presence here uh, to help us learn how we can live healthy, full lives. Uh, be with Dr. Youngberg and uh, bless him and his ministry as he travels and as he has his clinical practice and helping people live healthier, fuller lives. In your name we pray, amen. Thank you very much. It's, uh, I'm surprised we have so many people here. <laughs> uh, actually, driving from Spokane Airport to uh, Sandpoint was a cakewalk. It was, like, easy. Uh, well, we could still see, you know, while the sun was still out. But then coming back to six miles back south from the cabin, beautiful uh, Airbnb at, uh, about six miles from here. But that was kind of dicey. Yeah, that was kind of dicey. The, it was uh, a couple of times I was sliding on the snow a little further than I thought I would and uh, had to kind of get in a different lane not to hit somebody stopped at a light. Uh, so, but it kind of reminded me of driving in Michigan. I grew up in Michigan, so I love the cold weather. Uh, cold weather is the time I enjoy exercising the most. Uh, I used to, when I was in college at Andrews University, I'd get up early in the morning and go jog just about a mile and a half or so. Uh, and I, I'd love to have be the first, first footprints in the snow. And so I love cold weather. There's just something about a, going for a jog or a run in cold weather that that inspired me. In the summer, I didn't like to run that much. I'd play basketball, play other sports, but I didn't run much. But anyways, it's a pleasure for me to be here uh, in Sandpoint, Idaho with you. Uh, I know uh, Dr. Sandy has been trying to get me to come up here for two and a half years or more. <laughs> and I kept putting her off, putting her off. Finally, finally my wife says, Let, we're just going to Pick a date, we're going to do it. <laughs> so so it's, uh, uh, it's our pleasure to be here today. Um, we, it's a series, uh, tonight and tomorrow afternoon, entitled Secrets to Optimize Your Health, with a special emphasis on kicking off a new program that will be available, and, and you'll be hearing more announcements on that, it's called the Diabetes Undone Program. It's a series that I actually spent several years putting together to help, help individuals who struggled with some form of blood sugar disorder 
or insulin disorder actually reverse that disorder. And, and it's the area for many years that I felt was the pinnacle of to do lifestyle medicine right, you have to really know how to uh, uh, prevent and reverse type 2 diabetes. Uh, but in the last seven years, I've, I've uh, learned a lot and spent most of my clinical time dealing with another form of diabetes or insulin resistance, which is referred to by some as type 3 diabetes, uh, but it's also known as, as the diabetes of the brain. So the, the series this weekend is going to be going back and forth on and helping us understand the nuances, the underlying causes of these two conditions that seem to be so dissimilar when in fact they're very similar, they're just affecting different organ systems. One type 2 diabetes is basically uh, affecting the pancreas in a significant way or it is, it is uh, associated with the pancreas losing its function, literally the cells that make insulin are being destroyed little by little over time, losing their ability to release enough insulin or produce enough insulin to control blood sugars to the point where now we see somebody has type 2 diabetes or, or a more brittle type 2 diabetes. Well, in, in the last, well, actually almost 30 years now, but especially we've noticed in the last 10 and 5 years that diabetes of the brain or insulin resistance of the brain is a huge, huge thing. Most people are far more concerned about diabetes of the brain, otherwise known as Alzheimer's, okay, than they are about diabetes. But did you know that if you have diabetes, you're actually more than twice as likely to get Alzheimer's, okay? And it's not, it's not the diabetes per se that drives that risk. It's the underlying metabolic dysfunction. It is the underlying insulin resistance that causes it. And so, and so I, I'm going to jump right in because uh, I could spend 15 minutes on an introduction and my wife says, no, don't do that. Just get right in and, and address the facts. And there's, there's a lot of information. We're going to, uh, we're going to start. Oh, okay. Okay, that, that's fine. <laughs> um, we're we're going to, well, let me tell you a little bit about, again, my background. You heard in the introduction, I spent 14 years on the island of Guam and the and the other islands around Micronesia, which is a huge territory that, that basically the expanse moves all the way from just west of Hawaii and the Marshall Islands to basically just... Uh, you know, just south of Japan and, and north of Australia in, in the islands of Palau, et cetera. And the, the, those Micronesian islands are just an amazing place. And I was able to spend 14 years there with my wife. My, my daughters were born there. My son grew up there. And, um, it's, uh, and that's where I learned and understood the relationship between diabetes and how we can reverse diabetes most of the time, and even if we can't reverse it, we can dramatically improve it and, uh, and lower the risk of the complications, which is really the only thing that matters, is preventing the complications of the disease and how that relates to cognitive decline, uh, which is going to be the focus for, uh, for tonight. Uh, Dr. Drew Wagner, uh, wonderful to see you here. You must have driven at least an hour and a half to be here. Um, uh, is Joy here? Okay, my cousin Joy, uh, uh, Drew's wife, is here. It's, it's good. To, uh, looking forward to talking to you after the program. Um, so it's uh, uh, all right. We're just getting getting set up for for some of the slides. Now let me. A lot of people, when we're dealing with um, when we're dealing with uh, 
diabetes. Most people think, well, I don't have diabetes. I don't have any risk associated with that. But think again. The real problem with diabetes isn't really the high blood sugars. It's the underlying insulin resistance that we'll get into in a little bit. And it, uh, and that a lot of people know more about that by the diagnosis pre-diabetes. Now, I won't, I won't ask you to raise your hands, okay? But did you know that if you're between the ages of 40 and 59, at least one out of two of you, that's 50%, already have prediabetes or worse. In other words, if you don't have, if you're over the age of 40 and you don't have prediabetes, you're in a significant minority group, a, a minority group that is much healthier than the rest of the population. So it's very, very common, and most, I would say up to 90% of individuals in that age group, 40 to 59, actually don't know that because they haven't had the more sensitive blood testing that picks up the problem oftentimes 10, 20 years before it would be picked up by a standard physical blood work, like a fasting blood sugar. Fasting blood sugars are, are, are very important to understand, but that's by far not the most sensitive indicator of somebody having prediabetes. And as we'll learn here in a little bit, prediabetes is really one of the main drivers of Alzheimer's. In fact, researchers have, have documented that the number one most common driver of cognitive decline in Alzheimer's, which represents 80% of all dementias, is due to insulin resistance, most commonly known as metabolic syndrome, or uh, a tendency towards prediabetes or worse. Now, I have patients frequently ask me or, or wonder what the difference is between dementia and Alzheimer's. Dementia is just the umbrella term for cognitive decline that is measurable, that is observable, that where there's change in function that's significant enough that it's diagnosable. Um, Alzheimer's is the most common type of dementia, representing about 80% of individuals who have dementia. And then there's, uh, in fact, I, oftentimes somebody says, well, you know, I have, I have dementia, not Alzheimer's. And I go like, well, if you have dementia, you want to have Alzheimer's. You don't want to have the other forms of dementia, typically, because the, many of the other forms of dementia, which are more rare, are actually much more serious. Lewy body disease, frontal temporal dementia, et cetera. Those are much more serious conditions that, that are actually harder to manage. And so, so I've been spending a lot of my time actually addressing the underlying causes of, of dementia and Alzheimer's. Okay, uh, since we don't have, oh, they're up? Oh, okay, good, good. Um, because I, you know, I always have a backup, and when I, I actually have a backup on my iPhone where I can go through slides to keep me on track, okay, but I'm glad we don't have to do that. Okay, so tonight we're going to begin what I refer to as the 10 steps to prevent Alzheimer's and reverse cognitive decline. And, um, and so let's, uh, let's begin with some general statistics. About in in 2012, researchers looked at the global statistics relative to Alzheimer's, and especially here in the United States, and they found that out of the 318 million individuals that were currently alive in the United States in 2012, that a full 45 million of us, most of us, here, we're alive in 2012, okay? Uh, a full 45 million of us who survive long enough, right? We're going to have Alzheimer's. Unless we better understand the underlying causes and effectively 
treat those and, and, and not, just, not just normalizing those risk factors, but actually optimizing those risk factors. And so the, the premise that I operate on clinically and that has been shown to be effective over and over again is if, if we find enough of the underlying risk factors for you and I individually in this, this age of personalized medicine, we zero in. We don't treat you as a statistic anymore. We zero in and ask the question, what are your unique genetic and other risk factors that we can take advantage of so that we know what to do for you specifically. And if we add strategy upon strategy, as we learn more about the, the unique risk factors that you carry, we have greater and greater potential to get you to that tipping point where you're actually not only slowing down cognitive decline, which is always the first goal. When I have patients or couples come to me and one of them is struggling with cognitive decline or maybe they've been diagnosed with early Alzheimer's or impaired cognitive function of some kind, or maybe they have advanced Alzheimer's and they have finally realized, well, we got to do something about this. Um, I, I tell them three things. There's three goals. Number one is we want to slow this down. They go like, whoa, whoa, wait, we didn't come here to slow it down. We want to we want to get rid of this. Well, okay, the most important goal is to slow it down. Because once you start noticing cognitive decline, there is a snowball effect that takes place where it's not just gradually getting worse. It's, it's, like, it's, it's like building momentum and it's getting worse more rapidly. And so many people start noticing word finding issues or they, they're not as quick as they used to be. And then it can start to snowball unless we stop and ask the question, what are the factors that are contributing to me not having the same cognitive ability I used to have? It has nothing to do with how smart you are, by the way. Don't let anybody uh, suggest to you that Alzheimer's has something to do with your intelligence. It doesn't. Okay? It has to do with your ability to respond cognitively in the ways that you traditionally were able to when you were younger. Okay, and that difference between that. So, so, it's, um, so many of us are at risk, okay, and we're going to be looking at ways to begin to reverse that risk. So the first step, I, I suggest we're going to slow it down. That's by far the most important thing, because most people, it just gets worse, worse, and worse, and worse. That's the expected reality in the realm of Alzheimer's or any form of cognitive decline. It's just going to get worse. It doesn't stay the same. It's just going to get worse. And so if you can slow it down, you're way ahead of the curve compared to the vast uh, amount of people who have this challenge. This, this second, by the way, we believe that everybody can slow it down. If, if you start finding risk factors and addressing them, you're going to be healthier. That's just logic. That's just the way, and, and I've seen that operate clinically over and over and over again, and there's really good research documenting that now as well. The second goal is to stop the decline. You know, there's to put on the brakes, you know, take off, take the foot off the gas, number one, slow it down, you know, stop doing the things that are driving the problem, okay, uh, and number two, start pumping the brakes a little bit, that appropriate analogy for a night like this, right, uh, pump the brakes a little bit, I had to do that once tonight, um, where it was close, <laughs> and, um, and so if you can stop that, wow, you're so much better than the average person who's being treated for cognitive decline. And we believe that that is possible 80 to 90% of the time. Okay, of course, depending on, depending on how effective that individual is, is applying the information that they're gleaning from the testing, from the genetic work, and so forth. And thirdly, the goal is to begin to show reversal of some kind. Okay, so... Uh, I remember I was speaking at a conference about five years ago, and a well-known neurologist came up to me and says, says, Wes, you're not telling people we, that you can reverse Alzheimer's, are you? 
And I looked at him and said, so define Alzheimer's. He kind of, he kind of stu- stood back for a second. He's like, yeah, because he's the neurologist, right? I'm not a neurologist. But, and so, but he got the point. He says that it depends what you mean and how you define it. If you define Alzheimer's by a change in function where the ability to function normally day to day is being impaired, okay, and then you start addressing the underlying causes and function improves, what is that? By definition, that is a reversal in, uh, of sorts. It's not saying that you're now completely changing that, that the damage that has occurred and, and now you're back to where it was 30 years ago. We're not talking about that type of reversal per se, but we're talking about an improvement in function. And ultimately, this is all about function. It's all about improving function. So, all right, so let's, let's look at some other statistics. Uh, recently, I, was, I, I had the privilege to do a similar series for a church in London, England. And, uh, and so I was doing some, uh, a review of the literature looking at the statistics in England and, and discovered that one out of 11 people, uh, persons above the age of 65 already have Alzheimer's. Wow, wow. And then ultimately, by the age of 85, one out of two will have Alzheimer's, which is basically the same as it is here in the United States. But what was really interesting to me, you know, they have, in England, they have much better statistics than we do in the United States. They, they just, uh, and, and that, there's, there's no other time where that has been more evident than during a period of COVID. Yeah, the, the statistics that that our FDA and CDC put out were horrible, incomplete, uh, unreliable statistics. Whereas in England and many other countries like Israel, uh, etc., they put out really, really good statistics that you could actually uh, recognize as being valid. And so they have really, and so they have noticed that the number one cause of death in England. Yes, you probably guessed it. It's Alzheimer's. Number one. Okay, and I have a hunch that it's similar here in the United States. It's just that we have not, uh, we, we have not um, organized our public health and social services appropriately to gather that information as effectively. So, basically, 11, 11% of all deaths in England are because of Alzheimer's, number one cause. Okay, um, so, uh, and there's been, interestingly, there's been a 7% increase in death due to Alzheimer's just between years 2022 and 2023. Stop and think of what, what, what's going on there. We're going to be talking about that in a little bit here. Um, Also, in the United States, the top three causes of premature death are heart disease, cancer, number three, Alzheimer's. So so in the United States, based on the statistics that we've had, at least recently, it's the number three cause of of death. Some other... uh, uh, studies suggest number six cause. I think that it's uh, much closer to three, two, or one. All right, now what's, what's interesting and why this series is so critical this weekend is because all three of these conditions have seen exponential rises in death rate in the last two, three years. And when I say exponential, I mean exponential. I mean, dramatic, dramatic. We're going, to be, we're going to be doing a deeper dive into that tomorrow afternoon. What is the underlying cause of excess deaths? Uh, excess deaths are so high that it is, it, statistically, it's as, almost as unlikely as getting struck by lightning. That's how dramatic the rise of excess deaths has been in the last year in particular, 
it's really, really high. We're going to look at those statistics and, and talk about possible uh, under, uh, understanding the underlying causes of that. Well, just, just this morning, as I was driving to the uh, uh, Ontario airport early, I, I always, um, if I'm driving or if, I'm, if I have time where by myself where I'm not reading, I, I basically make sure I get, on, I get on the internet and I'm listening to a lecture. Uh, I'm always, always trying to challenge my current understanding so that, so that I can really understand what is truth. I remember I, um, years ago, well, over 20 years ago, I, I, I was so eager to, to establish an organization for my colleagues, uh, for, from pre preventive care doctors, that it's, it's a unique doctoral program at Loma Linda University that no other university around the country offers. It's uh, basically a doctorate in clinical preventive care, which is lifestyle medicine. And so there was just uh, a few hundred of us. And so I developed this organization called the American Preventive Care Association. And uh, did that for six, seven years until a colleague of mine, Dr. Uh, uh, John Kelly, uh, physician uh, and, and lifestyle medicine uh, per, uh, doctor as well, he, he, he said, hey, Wes, we need to set up a, a worldwide organization that is for all health professionals and that will attract all physicians to learn more about lifestyle medicine. And that's where the American College of Lifestyle Medicine came from, uh, which I had a part of being one of the founding directors of. Um, so, but while I was working on developing this early organization, we we're talking about our mission statement. I remember saying, says, says, I'm just searching for truth, whatever it is. I just want to know what's, what's accurate and what's true. And I remember one of my colleagues, you know, said, ah, that's kind of like too philosophical. I said, but, it, but especially now, post-COVID era, we understand how critical truth is. Because, because many scientists and many physicians and, and, and other health professionals now recognize that, that science and public health has taken a huge hit in our society where people cannot trust science the way it's referred to anymore. People cannot trust public health agencies anymore. People cannot trust the average doctor anymore because of, because of everything that happened during the COVID era. And, and so we need to be focused on what is true rather than following some narrative just because some agency suggested that's what we need to do. Okay, when we start censoring truth, then science dies. And, we, and one of the lectures that I listened to today um, suggested, it was one of the world's most famous oncologists right now, he says that we have entered into the dark age, dark age of science. Well, I, had, I hadn't thought of that until today. Uh, and I mean, that's what's happening. It's about, but uh, essentially we're where there's powers that be control the narrative much like, much like certain religious organizations during the dark ages controlled the politics and the narrative of the day. And basically, truth was what they said it was, not what truth really was. So we need to make sure we get away from this paradigm of, of, uh, of basically expecting people to believe as we do without giving them the facts and without allowing them the opportunity to engage in dialogue so that we can know what really is factually true. So with that in mind, as I was listening to this presentation just this morning, um, the, this, this study that was just published on January the 4th, 2024, just this week, uh, uh, entitled Lethal Infection of Human ACE2 Transgenic Mice Caused by SARS-CoV-2-Related Pangolin Coronavirus GX 
P2V virus. Well, that sounds like a, like a souped-up car, doesn't it? GX, you know, P2V, right? And that's essentially what this virus was, is a souped-up virus. And, and, and but let's just walk through this a little bit, because this blew my mind that scientists have not learned their lesson from COVID. They're still playing around in a laboratory making viruses that can kill up to 100% of the people uh, of the animals they infect. Is that, is that smart? Did we not learn anything from COVID? Okay, so, um, so this, was the, this was the abstract from this study. SARS-CoV-2 related pangolin coronavirus, GX, can cause 100% mortality. That's 100% kill rate in human ACE2 transgenic mice. Now, let me, let me break that down a little bit. This means that they have taken mice and they have inserted human genes into these mice, okay? Human genes that make the human ACE2 receptor for SARS-CoV-2. In other words, they're going to respond to that virus much like you and I would because we're human so we have the human ACE2 receptor protein uh, in, our, in our system, which is what connects to the COVID virus and allows it to enter the cell, causing an infection and whatever comes after that. Okay, so, so they're, they're basically changing the genetics of a, of a mouse to be more human. Is there any ethical problem with that? Um, and, uh, and, and this is, again, after everything that already happened before. So, and then these, these mice died, 100% of them, okay, uh, uh, due to a late-stage brain infection. So this, I, I'm bringing this into this lecture because we're talking about cognitive decline. And it's critical that we understand, if I, if I learned anything in the last, three, four years, is that infections are one of the worst things for our brain and for base, our, our cardiovascular health and for uh, our metabolic health. Infections drive our risk for diabetes, heart disease, and Alzheimer's a lot more than we realize. In fact, I think it's one of the main issues. When I was studying public health, 40 years ago at Loma Linda University, uh, the, the, the general concepts where you have, infect, you have communicable diseases, right? And then you have non-communicable diseases. And, and so heart disease was considered, and, uh, and cancer and most lifestyle-related diseases were considered to be non-communicable. In the sense that, in other words, they're not caused by an infection. They're not caused by, they're, they're caused by other things. And, and I remember there was, there was some point in my studying after I graduating, after graduating from uh, my program at Loma Linda, that I realized that there's really no ma major distinction between those because infections are a main cause of chronic disease. A main cause. In fact, I, I believe unless we really deep di uh, do a deep dive in understanding somebody's potential for chronic low-grade infections, we're not going to be able to reverse autoimmune disease. Autoimmune disease, a major cause, is low-grade infections. In other words, they, these are infections that you don't know you have necessarily or they're just smoldering under the surface. And this is one of the big problems that COVID has created is that it's created a scenario where now many people have chronic low-grade infections with COVID or, or related viruses. And, and it's, it's referred to as long COVID, and in many cases it's actually long vax, and we'll get into that later on. Uh, so... So brain infections are, are critical, and a big part of, of 
reversing cognitive decline is recognizing or tra- establishing whether there is a low-grade infection and properly reversing that. The second, big, the second most common underlying driver of autoimmune conditions is toxins, which is true also for most other chronic lifestyle-related diseases. So toxins and low-grade infections um, are, are huge factors that impair our immune system and increase our risk for developing and, and causing progression of many, many uh, various diseases. Okay, now, the, in the abstract, they went on to say, this underscores, this, this underscores a spillover risk of GX virus into humans, and let's just stop there. They're basically saying that this could be far, far worse than COVID ever was. Now, I think we have answers for this. So, so I'm, I'm not trying to create a state of fear here. Okay, I'm just trying to help us all recognize what we're dealing with and why we need to be more extra vigilant in addressing how to optimize our immune system, etc. All right. So, um, okay, so, let's, uh, now, so let's, let's quickly review this just published, what the researchers did is they inoculated intranasally. They put virus into these mice right through their snouts, okay? And, and um, again, there was a 100% kill rate from these viruses. And, and these viruses all died within eight days. And what they found was is that there was this extreme acute neurotoxic brain infection that was so quick in its development that by the third day after the virus was inserted inside the snouts of these mice, that they were able to visualize, clearly visualize, that there was uh, basically a breakdown or atrophy, rather, of, of parts of the brain. Three days of the, of the infection already. And then by the sixth day, it was a much bigger effect. And so what they found was that there was a very high level of this GX, SARS coronavirus-related uh, uh, virus, in the lungs, in the trachea, in the nose, the brain, and the eyes, but not other organs. Kind of very unique. You know, viruses uh, of different types only infect certain specific organs or tissues of the body. It's not, you, get a, you don't just get a virus that affects everything. Viruses are very specific. And this one is, is also very, very specific. What was really interesting is that is that the, they didn't see any inflammation. So I frequently, with my patients, will test the, of course, the, the high sensitivity cardiac CRP, which is a very common measure of inflammation systemically. It's in your blood, so it's throughout your whole body. But you can also test other forms of inflammation that are unrelated generally to each other. They're just different types of inflammation. And tests like interleukin-6 or tumor necrosis factor uh, alpha. And none of these were elevated in these mice that were basically dying rapidly of this brain infection. So that's, that's unusual. I didn't expect that. Um, so in other words, you can't just go through traditional tests in this case. Um, and so what, what really caught my eye, though was that this GX was cultured in a Beijing lab in China with a noted two amino acid muta- uh, mutations to the spike protein, which we know the spike protein is the toxin that causes damage. Okay, So that's why, that's why an ongoing low-grade infection from COVID from the actual infection of COVID is very, very bad for us. Even an acute short-term infection, bad for the brain. 
bad for the, for the pancreas. It, it can lead to diabetes. I'll explain how that can promote diabetes. In fact, I'll tell you tonight, um, uh, in 20, 2020, late 2020, I had kind of a panic call from uh, a lady in Mexico, in Mexico City. She'd had fairly bad COVID, uh, pretty bad symptoms, and her daughter, 11-year-old daughter, hadn't had any COVID symptoms, but then she developed bad diarrhea, and, and less than a week later was just feeling really horrible, went to the doctor, and the doctor was wise enough to check a, a finger stick blood sugar, and the blood sugars were over 900. She had developed type 1 diabetes from COVID. Okay, and so type 1 diabetes is a, a autoimmune disease. It's very different in, in causation from type 2 diabetes, even though type 2 diabetes, up to 20% of the time, actually has an autoimmune component too, but doctors rarely even consider checking for it. Okay, so, um, and so all these things interrelate one to another, and, and so the, the, the challenge with type 1 diabetes is that if you can catch it early enough and aggressively treat it and remove the cause of the problem, which usually means getting the immune system to work again properly and removing the toxic factors, plural, that led to the problem, you can actually get that person back to no longer being a type 1. But it has to be done very early in the game. Uh, I've only seen twice in my 35-year career somebody with type 1 diabetes that happened to be working with me around the time they were exposed. One of them was to mold. They were in an apartment that had a mold problem, and like I used to think when I, when I worked on Guam, oh, mold's not going to affect me because I'm healthy. Okay, well, whoa, I was wrong about that. Okay, mold, and I found out later that I have a unique um, uh, epigenetic haplotype proteonome that makes me super susceptible to mold toxins. So I, I have a daily protocol that I follow that helps my body remove mold toxins from my body because my body on its own doesn't do a very good job of that. So I was fortunate to learn that about, about seven years ago so that I'm not constantly exposed to this high-level mold toxin that isn't something I got recently. It's something that I had 20 years ago when I was in Guam. Okay, so, so we got we to gotta be aware that things that we were exposed to 20, 30 years ago could still be affecting us. So that, that's another topic for another day, though. So um, the, the bottom line is that we got to recognize what is causing damage to our body? Okay, what is causing or promoting diabetes is that the, the spike protein can get into the pancreatic beta cells that, make, that produce insulin, and they can cause a destruction of those beta cells. In fact, ironically, it happens through a mechanism where the cells produce a, a substance very similar to beta amyloid plaque produced in the brain that is designed to kill the virus. So the cells in the pancreas are producing a, they're producing a, um, th th this amyloid substance that fights the virus, but if it's a, if there's too much virus, that ends up destroying the cells of the pancreas that make insulin. And that's exactly one of the same things that happens pathologically in the brain, is that when the brain is exposed to toxins or infections, even unknown to you, that the, the, the brain, the glial cells of the brain, which are part of the immune system of the brain, they release beta amyloid. And did you know that beta amyloid is the best antimicrobial peptide 
antibiotic, antiviral the brain can make. So you don't want to get rid of beta amyloid. You want to manage it. If you got rid of beta amyloid, you would probably die of a brain infection because the brain would now not have its ability to kill off pathogens. Okay, so, so as you can see, there's a lot of things going on here. So, the, uh, the researchers ended by saying, um, they, they ended by saying here that, that they were highlighting that the risk of this new uh, SARS coronavirus, GX, that would spill over into humans. And I remember the, the, the doctor, the professor giving the lecture on this today, actually it was yesterday, he said, yeah, because you made the lab, the, the virus in your lab. That's why it's going to spill over. It's like, you know, so he was really upset about that uh, and about the ethical implications because, because it's so, so deadly. Okay, so this just underscores the importance of us understanding these factors. Now, uh, and by the way, the, the, one of the researchers on this study um, uh, uh, works at the Beijing Advanced Innovation Center for Soft Matter Science and Engineering. This sounds like an interesting title for somebody that's involved in gain-of-function engineering research. Uh, so, anyways, I, I thought that was, that was interesting. So, now, uh, I'm going to be going over the 10... 10 strategies tonight and tomorrow, okay? But I want you to understand that there's many more than 10 strategies. It's really critical to understand this. In fact, as as I do testing, et cetera, et cetera, and, and look at all the different factors that can give us clues as to what each of us can do to improve our health cognitively, Okay, it's, it's been referred to by Dr. Del Bredis, and this is one of his slides. He's, he's one of the most well-known neurologists in the world. He wrote the book, The End of Alzheimer's. He believes that we can get to the point where, where we're at much lower risk of Alzheimer's if we just understand the many causes of Alzheimer's. There's never going to be a drug that will fix Alzheimer's. Never. Why? Because it's not caused by one mechanism. It's caused by many mechanisms. And he uses the analogy of walking into a warehouse that has a roof with 36 holes in it. And then, and then some architect or some uh, contractor saying, well, let's just, let's just cover up the big holes. Okay? And there's three big holes. We'll cover up those. Then it'll be good, right? No, that, that, that building is uninhabitable until you fix the majority of the holes, if not all the holes. Now, in the biologic human physiologic system, we don't actually have to fix all the holes. We're we're never going to find all the holes, but we can try, okay? But the key is if we fix enough of them, the body's able to to address the other ones effectively enough so we're getting results, okay? So, all right, so let's jump right into this. So, I'm actually going to quickly outline for you tonight what we're going to be expanding uh, more, uh, more on in a little bit, but especially tomorrow afternoon at 2.30 until 5. We're, we have a lot of information, and I'm going to actually take a lot of questions and ans- uh, try to answer all your questions tomorrow as well. Uh, but tonight we just wanted to introduce this topic, and I want to share you what are the 10 areas that we're going to emphasize along with some other bonus information. Number one is that if we're going to be effective in slowing down, stopping, or beginning to reverse aspects of cognitive decline, we need to understand cause and effect. This is one of, one of, my, one of the big things that I learned from studying okay, uh, the Seventh-day Adventist Health Message is that we need to understand cause and effect. We need to study that and keep studying that, trying to understand what are the multiple underlying causes of this, whatever condition it is that we have or or we are at risk of, and then addressing those effectively. So we need to understand that by testing broadly for risk factors and then optimizing every one of them to the best of our ability. And so sometimes when I'm doing this testing with patients, 
they will, they will say to me, says, what, I have another problem? See, I came to you for this problem here. Now, now I have five other problems that I know about. Says, this, I'm getting really depressed. And I say to them, says, listen. I don't say it that way. <laughs> I say, so here's the good news. If we did not find these five things that we just found, you would not get better. But now that we know these other five areas that are collectively adding to your risk and creating um, a roadblock in improving function, now that we know about this, we can put time and effort and resources into that and, and not just try to normalize it, you know, not just try to you know, sweep it under the rug, okay, but actually optimize it. And the more we do that, the, more, the closer we're getting to that tipping point where we're dramatically improving our health in the area of concern. That's what we need to do. Okay, so, so that's, that's number one. Now, as we test broadly, and I'm going to go over tomorrow afternoon uh, a kind of a, a, an extended list of the type of testing that I recommend. Okay, but it's, it's critical to understand as we dive into the, the, the issues that dovetail the association between blood sugars, insulin Im imbalances, and Alzheimer's, or any form of cognitive decline. You could add any form of heart disease, any form of cancer to that list as well, by the way, because they're all related. So blood sugar and insulin resistance is actually not, not only the number one cause and driver of Alzheimer's, and when I say number one, I don't mean it's working all by itself and, and 100% responsible. I'm saying it's the big it's a big issue that needs to be addressed or else we're not going to get better. But there's other things that we need to do as well. But it's also uh, by uh, really good research. And a, a researcher that did what's called the Archimedes Principle, he found, they found by computer modeling that insulin resistance, which is blood sugar irregularities and insulin irregularities, dysfunction, okay, number one driver of heart attacks and strokes, number one way more important than cholesterol, way more important than triglycerides, um, and, and, even, uh, well, and even more important than, than high blood pressure, even though high blood pressure was a, was a distant second. Okay, so, so those are important things. So we need to understand how to do that. And let, let me just say, and we'll get into more details in a minute, uh, but uh, well, well, we'll talk about that in a minute. Number two. Take advantage of readily available educational resources. There's so much information out there. But where it's also we are in the age of disinformation. Okay, this is the dark ages. That, the, the dark ages, the, 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 the age of enlightenment has been dimming for quite some time. I'm, I wish I didn't have to say that. But it's been dimming for the last 30 years. But it really dimmed. It really dimmed a lot. Somebody put a bushel over the light uh, about four years ago, okay? And, and so it's hard to know who to trust now, even in peer-reviewed medical journals. Really, really hard, okay? And so, so you want to make sure you know how to pick the right resources. We'll talk about that, okay? Number three, personalized medicine in the form of genetic testing. I have found to, this is one of the most valuable things that I have learned, even in my own health. I'm going to tell you stories of how I use genetic testing. This is broad-based genetic testing with the saliva test that has unraveled mysteries for me or helped connect the dots for me that I didn't understand before. And now as I look at it, it says, I should have known that, but I didn't really appreciate it until I did the genetic testing. So that's, that's, not, that's number three. Number four, test and optimize your vitamin D. There's so much information on this, and there's so much disinformation on this as well. I hear about it all the time, and this disinformation is even coming from some of my trusted colleagues that, that focus just on one area, like, like just saying, 
only take them out enough vitamin D to protect your bones. Well, we've always known that you don't need that much vitamin D to protect your bones. You know, just, just a little bit of vitamin D will protect your bones. But we need to take enough vitamin D to protect your immune system, which requires a lot more vitamin D than what, it, what is required for our bones. Okay, more on that as we get into it. Um, so number five, do three types of exercises, which we're going to cover later on. Whoops. Um, test and optimize your omega-3 fatty acids. Really, really critical. Why? Because omega-3 fatty acids are very powerful um, way to lower our risk of heart disease and stroke. It's a very powerful way to, to lower our risk of any blood clotting, which is a huge issue now that COVID and the COVID vaccine has transpired. Blood clots are a huge, huge problem. And optimizing omega-3 fatty acids in the form of EPA and DHA, even more critical now than before. It's also a very important part of optimizing our immune system. And finally, our brain is made largely, okay, uh, to a, has a significant amount of DHA, omega-3 fatty acids. And so we need to make sure that we're getting enough of that. We'll talk about that. So, so I'm, give, I'm giving you the list. My wife has always told me, says, you got to give all the information on day one, <laughs> and then you can elaborate on it later. So that's what I'm doing. This is actually the first time I've ever done this. Okay. So Betsy, if you're listening, I'm doing it for you. And it was a good idea. I actually did all these slides on the plane flying out here this afternoon. Uh, so, um, and some of it in the San Francisco Air or the Sacramento airport. So, the, um, then we need to optimize sleep in quality, timing, and duration. And we'll explain why. Do you know that just having one night of poor sleep dramatically increases your insulin resistance the very next morning to the point if you're like borderline pre-diabetic or borderline diabetic, you just pass the border into that condition in one night. Okay, so this, this is huge. This is huge. And, and a big problem with cognitive decline, if you're not sleeping well, that's, that, is a, that is a real game changer. Uh, you have, we have to fix this. I realize, I know some of you are like rolling your eyes and, you know, like you have no idea how hard I try and it's not working. I, I know, I've been, I've been working with patients for over 35 years and I hear that all the time and so I realize it's easier said than done. What I'm saying is we got to figure it out. Can't just give up, okay? And that means, might mean you need to get a sleep test, you know, a sleep study. Where, where you figure out, do you have some form of sleep apnea or some other issue that can be addressed properly that can dramatically improve your health and your cognition? We're going to be learning about how cognition or dementia is transitory. The vast majority of, of dementia is, I feel this way right now because something that I'm, that I'm under the influence of we all understand this from a driving while under the influence or driving under in, uh, intoxication. Okay, that, that everybody knows that if you drink and drive, you're now, you're not, your brain is not working as well and you're more likely to make mistakes. And, and that's, why, that's why people get tickets and, and go to jail and, and that's why some people die because of, ah, oh, I'm okay. Okay, but did you know that you can have similar effects by other things, just like not sleeping well, can impact the brain almost as much as a DUI? You know, you can get a DUI from taking too much insulin. Did you know that? Legally, there's no difference. If you have an accident because you, you, you didn't eat right, you took too much insulin, your blood sugars got too low, and you, and you kill somebody, that's the same legal definition of going out and drinking and killing somebody. Okay, so we, we have to balance these things properly. Okay, so sleep quality is critical. Optimizing the diet. We could spend many, many hours 
talking about optimizing the diet. And, and we're going to be talking about foods that heal and foods that kill. And the foods that are most likely to kill the neurons, literally causing a atrophy, a breakdown, a, 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 a culling, a thinning out of the very cells in our brain responsible for holding on to memories so that we can have them 10 minutes from now or, or a day from now or a year from now. Converting short-term memory into long-term memory in our hippocampus is critical. In our hippocampi, we can lose a thousand cells a day if we're under the influence. The wrong influence. <laughs> the wrong influences, plural. If, on the other hand, we are under the right influences, the right influences, we are able to not only stop the destruction of a thousand neurons in our memory centers every day, but we're now able to rebuild seven, eight hundred new ones. That's reversal by definition. Okay, so how do we do that? And so that, these ten steps are the first part of that. Um, and then uh, be wise about alcohol. I'm going, to, I'm going to make sure you come back tomorrow to understand what that is. Be wise about alcohol. And this is really critical because there's a lot of disinformation in the medical literature on this topic. You all know it. You've heard about it. Okay? Okay, what, what do we do with studies that say, oh, you know, if you drink moderately, you have half the risk of heart disease or diabetes. Okay? We need to be wise. Is that... Is that accurate, or is there a method, method, methodology problem? can't say that tonight. Uh, is there a methods problem with the studies that lead us to understand that? Okay, so we'll, we'll talk about that. Okay, we'll, we'll look at the research as I understand it. And then optimize, finally, number 10, out of many others, but number, and I already talked a lot about it tonight, we got to optimize our immune system. And... Did you notice that every single uh, uh, step or prior to number 10 is actually building number 10? Everything we've talked about in this, this 10 steps to prevent Alzheimer's and optimize or reverse cognitive decline are, are built, working towards optimizing the immune system. I really think that's where the core is. If we don't have an optimal immune system, and we're in trouble for a lot of reasons, uh, especially if these brain viruses get out, right? That'd be bad news. Okay, okay, so let's, let's spend a little bit of time going over some of these first steps tonight, and we'll, com we'll complete that tomorrow night, uh, there, there, or tomorrow afternoon, rather. There's so much good information here. So number one, understanding the cause and effect, recognizing that the most common cause of dementia Insulin resistance, otherwise known as metabolic syndrome. Okay. By the way, metabolic syndrome as a medical diagnosis is, is objectively established as having three out of, the, out of five criteria. So if you have three out of these five criteria, you officially have metabolic syndrome. But essentially, metabolic syndrome is just another term for insulin resistance, where the pancreas is having to make more insulin than it should have to in order to control a blood sugar that's rising. Okay, why is the blood sugar rising? Well, we're maybe eating the wrong foods or our pancreas isn't working as well as it used to. Uh, and so the, the pancreas now has to make more insulin, even though it's already struggling, in order to try to control blood sugars. And in the end, what we what we have is not only a high blood sugar, but also a high insulin level. And of course, the, the, the tip of the iceberg of metabolic syndrome and insulin resistance is when we finally progress to the point that we can diagnose prediabetes. Prediabetes isn't the beginning of insulin resistance. It's, it's actually a very... Uh, extended or advanced form of insulin resistance, and that then can, can transfer into full-blown diabetes as well. So 
there's, there's specific ways to address this, and th- this is part of step one as well, is that I have every patient do a glucose tolerance test. In other words, we need to test for insulin resistance and how high does your insulin go in an attempt of the body to control blood sugars. That's just a blood test. And, and I, I like to see not only the fasting insulin, but then after a glucola, which is a 75-gram glucose drink, similar to what women get while they're pregnant. You know that obstetricians care far more about the health of their patients than most doctors do, <laughs> right? Because they have all their, their pregnant patients get this glucose tolerance test if they meet certain criteria. There's no such recommendation officially in medicine for everybody else. I think that's unfortunate. I've been doing glucose tolerance tests on every single patient I see for over 30 years, and I find it to be one of the best ways to pick up underlying metabolic risk factors that we'd otherwise not know by just doing a fasting test, including the hemoglobin A1c, fasting insulin, and fasting blood sugar. Those are all three really important tests, but they don't go far enough. We need, to, we need to put sugar into the system or carbohydrates into the system with a medical test and evaluate the impact on that. And so that, there's a lot more information in, in, in the resources I'm going to show you about how that works. Okay, why, why is this so important? I had the privilege in 1985, I was a, uh, the spring of 1985 was the first year student in my professional training at Loma Linda University, and because I was, I was, I was not able to, I didn't, um, I didn't qualify for loans properly that year, and I had to have one whole year without any money from my parents before I qualified for the loans, so I was in that no man's year, so I had, I could only take you know, my 10 or 12 credits that year. And so I just went to every single conference and grand rounds I could go to. I, I learned more that year than I learned any other year at Loma Linda University because I was always at a conference uh, and, and just learning from the experts in, 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 in academia and clinical work. And while there, I had the opportunity to hear a presentation by Dr. James Anderson, who was the uh, chief uh, endocrinologist for University of Kentucky at Lexington. And he blew us away in his lectures, and this is 1985, where he was presenting study after study that he had personally conducted at the University of Kentucky showing that he could reverse diabetes even in thin, brittle diabetics. And I remember thinking to myself, why isn't anybody else talking about this? Why is diabetes considered by every single agency, public health agency, as incurable? Why are the mantras associated with diabetes, you're going to have this condition for the rest of your life? Yeah, it says, uh, and why is it that the whole emphasis on treating a diabetic patient was all about management? when you could actually, most of the time, reverse the condition. And that is because most doctors were never taught how to reverse diabetes. There was no incentive in teaching doctors how to reverse diabetes. Um, Unfortunately, big pharma has a lot more pull, even back in the 80s, 40 years ago. Okay, so... So I listened to Dr. G, and you know, he was, he was a top academic in, in the world of diabetology, and, and yet he was not being listened to. At least he came to Loma Linda and gave his presentation and motivated me to, to emphasize understanding, and when I worked with patients, I wasn't just managing diabetes. I was encouraging them and showing them, helping them understand that you could reverse this. Okay, so uh, it was through my 14 years of uh, clinical work at, in Guam, where I was the director of the Lifestyle Medicine Clinic uh, uh, with the, the Guam Seventh Adventist uh, uh, Clinic System, which is you know big. It's actually a medical center. There are over 300 employees. Uh, it's not inpatient. It's all outpatient. But I had a wonderful opportunity to gain an insight on on 
preventing and reversing diabetes in, a, in an island where the, the risk of dying from diabetes was 500% higher than the death of dying on the U.S. mainland, which was, was already sky high. That's how bad it was. I remember, I remember uh, the, the first uh, week I was on uh, the island of Guam, and, and I was encouraged to go to a, a, a meet and greet, uh, a meet and greet meeting, uh, kind of a little uh, uh, special occasion of you know where new doctors came on the island, meet meet other doctors from other clinics, and, and so one of the docs came up to me and says, "Well, you know, what's your specialty? What do, what do you do?" And I told him what I did, and he laughed at me. <laughs> he laughed at me. He says, "You're gonna you're gonna do what? You're gonna try to reverse diabetes on Guam?" And they said, "Good luck." I mean, he was being nice. He wasn't mocking me, you know. And I I, I had a good laugh too. I said, "No, it's going to happen." He says, "You just have we have to take the time to educate the public." And that's, that's why I did an hour-long live call-in show for 11 years. Every Wednesday afternoon, I'm driving as fast as I can to the radio station to spend an hour just answering questions and doing programs and live. And, and that, among many other things that we did, working with the government to do presentations everywhere we could. Okay? And, and that turned the island around. The, 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 the get-togethers, the potlucks. That, that were in Guam, when I first got there, is I couldn't find one thing I could eat that was healthy. Not one thing. Okay, and, and, then, and by the time we left, there was all kinds of good healthy food available because they now, now learned. They learned what was, what was good and it was socially acceptable to eat healthy food again. All right, so I, I, I wrote this book along with my cousin's daughter, Elise Harbolt, my cousin, uh, Susan, Susan Harbolt, um, who actually, her husband went to school with Dr. Drew Wagner, right? So, um, a pathologist. Uh, their daughter, uh, Elise, uh, got the, the task of working with me for a whole year. Uh, uh, and we literally, we really spent three to four hours every other night, three nights a week, at a Mediterranean restaurant eating pea soup and salad. <laughs> and, and she could type faster than I could talk, and she, she typed all my experiences and perspectives and case studies, and that's how we came up with this book. Okay, so so it's, a, it's, 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 it's basically an outline of using lifestyle medicine principles, how we reverse diabetes, and those principles are now available in the program Diabetes Undone, which will be starting next Tuesday. Am I hearing that right? Did I get that right? Next Tuesday, where's it going to be? It's, it's on, okay, it'll be on the church website as, as, uh, for information. Take advantage of that. I just finished running that program in, in, uh, near where I live. And we tur- it was a it was a ten ten week program once a week. We had thirty six people in the program. It was just an, it's just amazing to see the lights go on and people said, "You mean I can potentially reverse this, or I can dramatically improve my health?" So take advantage of that program. Uh, all right, so that that's the Diabetes Undone program. Uh, ten of the short videos. Uh, it, it's set up as short videos that are educational with discussion and, and commentary by, from your local professionals. And, um, and I, it, we did it with, uh, with Brenda Davis, who's one of the, I think of her as the top nutritionist in the world, the dietitian in the world. She, she's written like 12 books on nutrition. She's brilliant. And uh, I've done a lot of lecturing with her on how to reverse diabetes. Okay. Okay. Um, in, in, um, in 2014, Dr. Dale Bredesen wrote uh, a paper outlining the, the experience of 10 of his patients that had uh, some, either early Alzheimer's or some form of, of um, cognitive impairment, and how all 10 of these patients dramatically improved or actually reversed aspects of their cognitive decline where now they were functional again. And I remember reading this study, I I think it was in 2015, 
And what really caught my eye is that he had outlined the mechanisms, the underlying mechanisms of disease that, that I had been studying for many years already in reversing diabetes. And then I realized that it's the same protocol, only even more expansive. And so, um, and so the, basically, is, it was at this, this study, this paper that I read, that proved to me that the majority of Alzheimer's risk is associated with metabolic factors that we already just talked about. Okay, so, so Dr. Del Bredesen, of course, is the, the neurologist who wrote the book, The End of Alzheimer's. Now, um, another, um, okay, and then real quick, Dr. Suzanne de Lamont, who is a, a uh, neuropathologist at Brown University, she, she discovered in the 1990s that, that her, that, that, Patients who had died with Alzheimer's that consented to have their brains examined, she discovered that the, the brains of Alzheimer's patients were extremely resistant to insulin. And that's what began the, this, this coming together of, of, of realizing that the same treatments that we use to naturally reverse diabetes can be used to reverse aspects of cognitive decline as well. So that's, that's where that came from. This is Dr. Bredesen and myself uh, when I was training with him in San Francisco uh, quite some years ago. And then uh, in 2018, I had the privilege to, to be a co-author with Dr. Bredesen uh, in the Journal of Alzheimer's Disease and Parkinsonism, where we had 100 patients that were able to reverse some aspect of cognitive decline, early Alzheimer's or um, impaired cognitive function. Okay, and then this is a paper that I wrote for the American. I presented this at the American College of Lifestyle Medicine, mainly because Dr. Bredesen got called away to Europe, so he couldn't do the keynote, so I was asked to do it, which I was happy to do. Uh, and then I was asked by the American Journal of Lifestyle Medicine to put that into a, a paper for them. So this is, so in other words, this isn't, this isn't just somebody's idea. This, there, this has been well developed and researched and there's all kinds of information on this. Now, um, we need to then take advantage of readily available educational materials. So that's step number two that we, that we outline. Okay, and, and, and essentially, it reminds me of a, of a quote from Henry Ford who says, whether you think you can or think you can't, you're usually right. And, and so this, is, this, really, this really cuts to the core of dealing with Alzheimer's because there's all kinds of naysayers out there. I worked at reversing diabetes from the mid-80s through through 2010, when it was still kind of taboo to say that you could reverse diabetes. You know, I mean, literally, literally, doctors would challenge me up on stage at major conferences when I talked about this. I remember one time uh, a doctor who actually was a nephrologist who was in charge of the scientific committee bringing speakers in for this major conference on, on diabetes. <laughs> and, uh, and so I gave what I thought was a really good presentation on, on diabetes reversal. And, and he got up afterwards, before he was to take questions, he got, got up at the podium, he says, says uh, and he did this, he, he wasn't trying to mock me, he was just saying what he believed, I, I think. And, he, and I think he was also afraid of what some of the other people doctors or scientists would say to him, but weren't willing to say it to me. And so he got up in front and says, I just want to go on record that I completely disagree with what Dr. Youngberg asserted with regards to reversing diabetes. You could have heard a pin drop. <laughs> this, was, this was a double ballroom at the Hilton at a regional medical society meeting. And um, and there was over 500 health professionals, mostly physicians, in the audience. And they were all looking at me 
<laughs> and they're looking at him. They're like, what's, what's he going to say about this? You know, what's my retort to that? Right? And so I remember, uh, I remember praying to God. I said, Lord, give me the words. I don't want to turn this into a you know, confrontation. I don't want to come across as hostile. And, um, and then, you know what, my, what, what, the, what the answer to prayer was? Is that uh, he, he, he then said, and there had been an international speaker right before I spoke on genetic engineering, interestingly enough. Okay? And this was early 2000s, maybe, maybe 2004. And, um, and, uh, and so he said, in deference to this international speaker who had talked about the po- future potential of reversing diabetes with genetic engineering. And so he then said, yeah, unless, of course, we're using genetic engineering principles that haven't been worked out yet. So then he looked at me, and so, and so I, I came up to the podium, and I said, well, First, I thanked him for his willingness to be, tell, tell, tell us what he thought. And I said, you know what, you're not the only one in the audience that, that believes that. I'm sure there's many of you in the audience who think that as well. Says, and said, let me explain something. He says, I'm glad you mentioned that, that someday in the future, genetic engineering will be able to reverse type 2 diabetes. Because that is exactly how lifestyle medicine operates in reversing diabetes, it's, it's changing the epigenetic status of that individual, and literally it's a form of genetic engineering. And with that, he kind of looked at me, and said, wow, that's a good answer. <laughs> and, then, and then that was the end of that discussion. So, it's, um, so I, I, I spent over 30 years practicing in a way that many of my colleagues, my friends, were even upset at me because of what I said about diabetes. Because the way they practiced did not reverse diabetes. Because you can't reverse diabetes with a medicine. It's impossible. You can lower the blood sugars, but the Mayo Clinic studies showed clearly that optimizing blood sugars in many cases actually makes your likelihood of dying prematurely higher. It's not all about blood sugars. It's all about how you lower your blood sugars. Okay, so, so, that, so that applies to both understanding the, the, the process of reversing a, any chronic disease, whether it's heart disease. You know, Dr. Dean Ornish, he took a lot of a flack back uh, over th- almost 30 years ago now saying in publishing in, in peer-reviewed medical journals that you could reverse heart disease. And a lot of people were furious with him saying that you could do that. He says, you can't reverse heart disease. And there's still doctors today who believe you can't reverse heart disease. Why? Because they have never taken the time to look at the studies and experience that in their own practice. Okay, so, um, so whether you think you can or you think you can't, you're usually right. And so that's why perspective is everything. That's why I'm talking about helping you understand the perspectives. Because just giving you a whole bunch of things to do oftentimes doesn't work. Because unless you really believe it's possible, there's no way you're going to put the time and effort and resources into doing not just the 10 things I'm mentioning, okay, but, but the other 36 holes in the roof uh, that, need, that, that can be fixed as well. Okay, uh, just uh, six weeks ago, I had the privilege to attend the premiere showing of, of this documentary called Memories for Life. Uh, it was shown at one of the old um, uh, artsy theaters in San Francisco, and, and everybody who was part of the uh, documentary, Dr. Bredesen, his whole family, his wife is a functional medicine doctor, his daughter Tess is an is a, uh, Alzheimer's coach, uh, and, and now working with uh, Ariana Huntington, with the Huntington Post, doing all kinds of really cool uh, health things. And so this documentary is amazing. It's 90 minutes. You can, you can rent it on Apple TV, Google, 
uh, or um, uh, Amazon Prime for like three bucks. You can watch the whole thing. And it's a fascinating documentary that looks at both the, 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 those who have worked the system and shown that it w can help people dramatically improve their cognitive function, but it also interviews the naysayers, the, the, the ivory tower types that don't believe that it has anything that, that it, anything can be really done to, to improve cognitive function uh, other than temporary medication management. So, so, take a, so that's a great resource that I would recommend. Now, I, spent, I have a 15-hour series that I recommend for families of patients that I work with called Reignite Recognition that, that is available on my website. Uh, so, the, you know, I, I'm always stressed when I give talks like this because, you know, I literally, I was stressed when I did the 15-hour series because I had 30 hours worth of material. Okay, so so it, it's really hard to boil it down to 10 steps. Uh, but, and then the book Memory Makeover, which uh, I was literally forced to write this by my father. <laughs> I would have never done it if it wasn't for his constant encouragement, like, you got to write this, because I was doing a major talk in Chattanooga, Tennessee, about four years ago, and, and, we, and the goal was to have this book ready for this big presentation where we had 1,500 people attend and, and that, that wanted to understand how to optimize cognitive function. Okay, now, another resource is a series that's available for free on rumble.com, which should give you a clue. It's not on, it's not on uh, YouTube, <laughs> okay? Uh, and it was entitled, it was, I did this for um, Danny Vieira, or Daniel Vieira, and his Health and Healing Crusade in April of 2023. And he wanted me to do two or three presentations for this program. Then they made it an online program. And I said, Daniel, I have so much information on this. Let's, is it okay if we just record the whole thing? And he said, let's do it. So we started at 12 o'clock on a Friday, and we didn't finish recording until 7 o'clock on Friday uh, and Friday evening. Seven hours. Seven hours. It's called the Rise of Immune Deficiency, Diabetes, Dementia. You see the connection? Diabetes and dementia related to immune deficiency, and then the cardiovascular autoimmune connection with COVID infection and COVID vaccination. So if you want a deeper dive into this, uh, from uh, my clinical experience and research that was available up to April of 2023, take a look at that. That's a, a, that's a really a profound series. Um, okay, and then again, pitching, see here at Sandpoint, we have this uh, Diabetes Undone program that's starting next, this coming Tuesday. And uh, if you want, so again, if you have any issues with cognitive decline or cardiovascular disease or hypertension or, or high cholesterol or, or struggle with weight loss, any issue with that, this program is for you. It's titled Diabetes Undone, but it's really addressing the underlying causes of diabetes, which are the same underlying causes as pretty much all other chronic diseases. It's very broad-based product. It's a lifestyle medicine program. We just called it Diabetes Undone because we had to be more specific than just it's for everybody, right? But take advantage of that. Okay. Um, step three. Uh, it's actually 7.30. Shall we end now and then, and then continue tomorrow afternoon? Would that be... Uh, you know, I, I hate it when, when speakers ask, should I keep going? Because usually you know, half the people are going, like, don't say yes! Don't say yes! I actually... Um, let, let me just finish one more. And then we'll and then we'll and then we'll end and and uh, then we'll officially officially we'll we'll uh, let you go home and and drive the streets that are frozen now uh, <laughs> so drive carefully but I will stay by and answer some questions uh, for a while for those of you that want to stay by I, I I gotta have spent some time with my cousin Joy and her husband Drew okay uh, but other than that uh, I'll stay by and then tomorrow we'll have a lot of time to really get into the, the deep weeds and understand this a lot better. So all the things that I'm just touching the surface of tonight, 
I'm really motivating you to come tomorrow because that's where the, most of the, the meat of the topic will be discussed. So step three, it's actually really a, a powerful strategy, personalized medicine guidance. It was 2003 when the Human Genome Project was completed, most of it in San Diego, California, by the top geneticists around the world. The entire human genome had been decoded. That ushered in the age of personalized medicine. It ushered, it ushered in the potential, I should say, the potential to, to do research in a completely different area of rather than, than just using a medicine that, that kills something to look at maybe developing medicines that optimize the expression of healthy genes that turn off cancer, that, that turn on the genes that suppress cancer. That's why tomorrow afternoon we're going to be talking about some recent developments that have actually caused a suppression of the tumor suppressant genes. The BRCA1 and 2, the, the breast cancer and ovarian cancer genes. Actually, those genes don't cause cancer. Those genes prevent cancer, but when they get shut down, when they get suppressed, the tumor suppressor genes no longer can suppress cancer, and, and cancer comes roaring. Uh, not only new cancers, but old cancers that have been dormant for years and years come back roaring. We are now at an exponential rise of cancer all around the world that's been referred to in lay terms as turbo cancers. Many oncologists are calling it turbo cancer as well. Why? Because, because when you turn off the tumor suppressor genes or when you turn it down like a squelch knob, you just turn it down so it's not as functional as it used to be, what do you expect? Okay, your ability previously, and we all get cancer from time to time, right? We all do, but the body su suppresses it and gets rid of it. That's the way the body was designed. This is really a passionate topic for me because my mother died of glioblastoma when I was 10. And that's what gave me a passion for understanding cause and effect. And... and I, I, I mean, I, I shudder to think of what we're in store for because of the last three years. Because we're already seeing a huge uptick, an unbelievable uptake of deaths due to diabetes, dementia, those two are huge, and cancer is close behind, but potentially will, I think all of them are going to rise exponentially over the next few years. So we need to be ready for that and try to hold that back and get our immune system back. So genetic testing actually helps us do that. It, it, well, let's, let's just talk about this. So we, we have about 20,000 genes in the human genome that are now decoded, and it was Plato who said, know thyself. And there's no better scientific way to apply this, this uh, idiom to know ourselves is to understand what unique genetic mutations we carry. And some people say, like, I don't want to know what my genetic mutations are because I'm just going to be stressed beyond, beyond measure for the next 20, 30 years if I find out I have the Alzheimer's gene. And, and, and I, you know what I do? I tell them this story. It's kind of a Winnie the Pooh analogy. You know, the 100-acre wood Okay. I said, what if you had, just picture this, you had a hundred acre wood behind your cabin in the mountains. And, and you're, you, you have lots of grandkids. And your grandkids like to invite all their friends to come to the cabin in the hundred acre wood. And just, just be kids again like they used to be 20, uh, 30, 40, 50 years ago. Where they just spend the day out in the woods just exploring, you know. Kind of a, a bygone era, right? And says, but would, would you want to know, would you want to know that somewhere in that 100-acre wood, there's a mine shaft that drops 1,000 feet below? Would you want to know that, or would that be too terrible to know? And they instantly understand my point. 
Okay? Individuals who don't want to know that they have a genetic mutation that can cause serious harm over time are basically an ostrich with their head in the sand that actually is increasing the likelihood of something very horrible happening to you. Okay? And, and uh, the good news is that when, when I found out about some major mutations that I had, I actually celebrated. There wasn't even a moment where I went, oh, God, how could this happen to me? Why me? Right? So, so I, I find out, here, here this, is, this is me. Yeah, okay. This is me, Wes Youngberg. So I'm not breaking any HIPAA laws because it's mine, right? I'm, I give full consent for you to see this. So I show this to all my patients as I encourage them to consider getting genetic testing. Okay, so one of the 58 pages on this genetic report that you can get from downloading data and up uploading it into another app through 23andMe or Ancestry.com, uh, you can see a whole section on just blood clotting risk. This is blood clotting risk that comes from having mutations to genes, to genes or single nucleotide polymorphisms, call them SNPs. These are just portions of genes that code for some, some risk reduction or risk increase. And if that gene is mutated and that gene is otherwise there to protect you, that means that you're at higher risk now of that condition than you would have been if it had been the normal wild type variant. And so as you can see here, I have the factor five Leiden mutation. So you, you physicians in the room, no, that's not a good thing. Okay, enjoy. That's just part of our family tree, unfortunately. I don't know if you've been tested for that, but uh, I've had so many of my cousins actually test for this and found out, yes, in fact, they, they actually have it. Half my kids have that. Not half. I think two of my three children have this mutation as well. And so, they, yeah, thanks, Dad, for, for this mutation. So even as a single copy mutation to factor five Leiden, that increases my risk of having a deep vein thrombosis or pulmonary embolism or any other form of blood clot by 800%. Is that important to know? Or is that too terrible? No, I, I never thought it was too terrible because I understood that genetics is, is not this unchangeable factor uh, or risk factor. We can't change the fact that we have the mutation. What we can change its effect on us. Its ultimate physiologic outcome is the only thing that really matters. And by understanding what mutations we have, we can precisely pinpoint the enzyme or the biochemical pathway associated with that enzyme that is, that is now dysfunctional in part because of the mutation, and we know precisely what other factors or cofactors are responsible for improving that, enzym that enzyme's function. So even though you can't change the mutation, you can, you can actually upregulate the epigenetic expression of that gene and therefore the enzyme function so that, so that it operates more efficiently, dramatically more efficiently. In some cases, almost 100% fix of the biochemical effect of that mutation. So I know exactly what I need to do to protect myself from a blood clot. And I practice that every day, multiple times a day, to, to make sure that I don't suffer something and I, I am protected from this because I know about my mutation. So I'm not lax in my thinking, oh, I don't need to, I don't need to walk after the meal. I don't need to do that. So genetic... Genetic factors are very important. The other big, there's all kinds of genes. Okay, and here's a patient, name blotted out as you can see, that has an APOE4 single copy mutation. That represents roughly, if you look at the collective of the research, about a 500% increased relative risk of developing Alzheimer's compared to others who don't have that gene, who might have the same lifestyle but do not have that gene mutation. Do you want to know this? Absolutely you want to know this because it is not a, what we call a fully determinant. 
Okay? It does, it does, not, it does not determine what's going to happen in the ultimate. It just says, you're at higher risk, you're living near a swimming pool, make sure you don't let your kids drown in the swimming pool, right? Make sure you have things worked out so that never happens, right? And, and there's many other examples and analogies that we could discuss. So, so if there's a double copy mutation to the ApoE4 epsilon, then you have uh, roughly on average, based on the various studies, about a 1,300% increase risk, relative risk of developing Alzheimer's. Again, largely modifiable in terms of its outcome by making sure we're not only following the 10 steps we're addressing this weekend, but every other step we can figure out. The more we learn about our genetic and other medical weaknesses, the healthier we're going to be. Have you ever heard somebody say, man, I'm so glad I got cancer because it was the cancer diagnosis that saved my life. Otherwise known as the, the idiom, um, uh, if you really want to be healthy, get yourself diagnosed with a, a serious chronic disease and reverse it. I'm serious. That, that, that it's by a better understanding of what's going on, what our Achilles heels are, that we can exponentially improve our health. Okay, I'm wrapping up here. So with Alzheimer's, um, if you have the uh, ApoE33, which is the normal wild-type variant, I, they call it wild-type just because it's the most common variant there is, and generally the one you want. Uh, so if you, have, if you don't have a mutation to ApoE3, or the ApoE gene rather, then your risk of developing Alzheimer's by age 84 is 1 out of 2. Okay? If, however, you have one of the mutations, you develop Alzheimer's uh, at the same level 9 years earlier. If you have a double copy mutation, you, you, you get it even earlier than that at age 60, uh, 68. So it makes a difference, but if people knew about it early enough, they could actually reverse much of that risk. Um, so basically, uh, uh, Dr. Uh, Pembrey, a, a professor of clinical genetics, he says we are guardians of our genome. So no longer are we victims of our genetics, of our genome, but we can be masters of our genome by understanding what our limitations are in optimizing that uh, through, through various protocols. So ultimately what I say is dysfunctional genes must be first detected, then supported holistically, and finally nutrigenomically, which is using nutrition at its ultimate uh, and other factors to bypass that mutation in order to supply their nutrient deficiency. So many mutations okay, are basically increasing the need for certain nutrients. That's really important to understand because the mutations create defective enzymes that have a certain biochemical process that require various nutrients like magnesium, minerals, vitamins, and other other nutritional cofactors to operate. So if there's a mutation leading to a dysfunctional enzyme, you need a lot more of those given nutrients to get better biochemical flow from that enzyme. So that's why you can't just go by the, the you know, daily, uh, uh, recommended daily intakes. You can't go by that. that that's a general, maybe, recommendation that's valid. But that doesn't apply necessarily to you or to me. Okay? We, that's why genetics and personalized medicine is so, so beneficial. So, um, so basically, then, then you have the issue of epigenetics, which is the expression of genes. And we're going to be getting into that tomorrow afternoon starting at 2.30. God bless. Uh, let, let me say a prayer uh, before we end. God, I just thank you for the opportunity to learn more about how fearfully and wonderfully you have made us. I just pray, Lord, that you give us the wisdom and the insight to begin to better understand um, the, the relationship between cause and effect and the things that we can do 
starting today and this weekend to dramatically improve our health over time. We thank you for that. We, we, uh, I ask a special blessing on everybody present here physically and everybody watching this online or in, uh, on video that you will guide their thinking so they can apply this information in a way to dramatically improve their health, Lord. I pray we thank you for your love. In Jesus' name, amen. And please keep us safe as we drive home tonight. Uh, all right, so you are officially dismissed. I know some of you have children. You need to get home. I'd like to. Okay. All right. So thank you. So so the three types of exercise. So let me give you a, a, a quick overview of that. Okay. Number one, because insulin resistance is so critical, what happens is our blood. There's many people have perfect fasting blood sugars, perfect fasting insulin, but as soon as they eat anything, their blood sugar shoots up and their insulin levels shoot up. That's really bad for the brain. Really bad for the brain. Okay, but, so that's why I encourage that test. But one way to counter that naturally is to go for a light walk immediately after eating. It doesn't have to be a walk. Let's say if somebody, there's always somebody says, well, wait a minute, my hip is out or my knees are bad or I have sprained ankle. Any movement, you know, moving, your, moving your arms up and down like this is, is actually really good exercise. Just move your body enough to make it feel like you're getting a, you're breathing a little bit deeper. Okay, not hard exercise, just light to moderate exercise immediately after eating. And, and that should be at least five to 10 minutes. When we get started, if we're not used to doing that, you know, most of us after eating a meal, we just want to like doze off, right? And so that's because blood has left the brain and is focusing on digestion. We want blood to start recirculating from digestion, taking those nutrients to the brain and to the muscles, and that's really good for your immune system and, and cognitive function. So that's number one. Number two is, uh, bottom line, is, is some get sweaty exercise, okay, or somewhat hard exercise, where you get your heart rate up, we call it the cardiorespiratory exercises or aerobic exercise of some kind, like brisk walking, uh, swimming. Um, stay, out, stay away from the lake, though, until, until it thaws out. Okay? And, uh, and, and those type of ex bike riding or stationary bicycle riding, any of that, that's, that type of exercise is really good for circulation, really good for the brain. And then uh, there's a lot more on that that I'll discuss this afternoon, tomorrow afternoon. But the last thing is strength training. A lot of people, unless they're involved in sports, they go like, I don't need to strength train. That's just for the jocks. Absolutely wrong. Strength training is probably the single most important simple strategy, or what I call natural strategy, to improve brain function. Not just because it increases blood flow to the brain, because it, in it increases direct neuromuscular effect on brain cells that stimulate the brain. It's, it's, it's almost better to exercise than to do brain stimulating exercises, even though both are important. Okay, so that's a quick summary of the three. Okay, other questions? Just raise your hand and, and uh, we'll bring the mic to you. You yes. mentioned DHA, um, but I heard that uh, like the non-vegan version of DHA is better. Is there does it matter which kind, vegan or animal-based? I think that is uh, the idea that non-vegan DHA is better than vegan DHA, or DHA rather. Um, I think that's grasping at straws a little bit. Um, I would not make that distinction. 
uh, I would say that they're equivalent because they're, you know, it's, it's, they're both DHA, right? They're, um, and and um, the, it basically you want about 1,000 milligrams of DHA daily of, of, of some form. Now, the, the fish oil form of DHA, um, I always ask my patients, do you, eat, do you eat any fish? And if they say yes, then there's no reason not to use the fish oil, especially since it's a lot healthier than fish. <laughs> it's because uh, there's no toxins. It's molecularly distilled. And so uh, you're basically getting pure EPA DHA uh, from a fish oil that has been refined and purified. So you're actually getting, you're all, when it's distilled, all the toxins are left behind. Okay, so I don't have a problem with somebody using uh, purified fish oils. They're less expensive. Okay, but, uh, but for many reasons, people like the vegan DHA, and I, I like the vegan DHA, which is made from microalgae. And the key is just good enough. And we'll go over the studies that document how much and, and in what way to, uh, tomorrow. Yes. Uh, how much does heavy use of uh, antibiotics um, affect? Okay, that's, that's one of the, the uh, extra 10 steps, <laughs> the next 10 steps. Uh, there's, there's actually a huge relationship between the gut and the brain. So much so that there's now journals, medical journals, that are totally devoted to the gut-brain connection. Some of them referring to the gut as the second brain. The microbiome, the healthy bacteria in the gut, have a huge influence on brain function. Okay? And this is one of the big problems that COVID infection and COVID vaccines have caused, is that they have greatly damaged the gut microbiome. Both of them have. Um, uh, and, and, and we'll talk a lot more about that tomorrow afternoon. Okay, but essentially, we, you, you want to make sure that you're using antibiotics only when it's necessary or appropriate, and that can be challenging, because a lot of patients who go to the doctor, you know, they don't want to be given a health lecture and, and, and sent home without a prescription. I right? said, so why did I pay you all that money? You didn't even give me a prescription. So doctors feel kind of uh, forced to, to write out a prescription, and that's creating a lot of problems. And so there, there's a balance there. I'm not, 100, I'm not against all antibiotics, but I think a lot of the use of antibiotics is, is excessive and causes a lot of problems with, uh, uh, with the gut in particular. So we need to re-inoculate the gut with the healthy bacteria, in particular bifidobacteria. And that's, I addressed that in my seven-part series entitled The Rise of Immune Dysfunction, Diabetes and Dementia. Okay, I addressed that. There's a whole, whole presentation on that very topic on rumble.com. You just go to rumble.com, type in my name, and you'll see that series. Okay, uh, I'll follow the mic. Where's the, are we done? Uh, there's a question right here. Do you have a preference between 23andMe and Ancestry.com, and have you ever been concerned? I should say I sometimes am concerned about having that much of my data out there. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, great question. Um, so, so I was, I was, I've always been concerned about privacy and medical information. And of course, the the age of medical privacy is is long gone, right? It's the whole, ever since HIPAA just started, that was the beginning of the end of medical privacy. Kind of an awkward thing in my perspective. And so, uh, so basically, anytime your data is out there, somebody can get it. Somebody can hack it. Somebody really wants your data, they're going to get your data. Um, now, that's, that's not only true for genetic information, but it's true for any medical, any health, really any information at all. So when I first was looking into it. I had the same critical thinking question that you had. And, and I, was, I was really deliberating, like, I don't want to, I don't want to have my genetic information owned by Google. Yeah, I don't expect them to make good ethical decisions, right? I mean, let's just face it, right? So uh, any organization who wants to be the mind of God, 
you know, is probably not making the, the best decisions for you and I and the ultimate. So, so yeah, I, I get that concern. But then I, I had an epiphany. And here's the epiphany. They already have it. Okay? Our, it, it, genetics is easier information to get than your CBC and metabolic profile. Okay? You can get genetics from a strand of hair, from a little saliva test, from a stool test. You can get it from any body tissue. Okay? And so if somebody wants your genetics, they already have it. Okay? So, so I'm, I'm, I, I, I still think there's an issue of making it easier for them to get the genetics, but the, 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 the determining factor in my mind is that we need to know ourselves. And so to me, knowing about my genetic information in a way that I can make dramatic change to my future health potential outweighs the possibility that, that Google is going to sell my information to China. Okay? Or, or, or to anybody for that matter. Okay? And that's probably happening. Okay? That's probably happening. And, uh, and by the way, 23andMe just got a major hack uh, like a month ago. And I had patients this week that couldn't access their raw data because of that hack. So, so yeah, information is hacked every day. Anytime you use a credit card, there's a significant chance that that credit card could get hacked. Anytime you do anything electronically, banking or otherwise, there's a chance that all that information is going to be available to somebody that they can manipulate. But do you want to use the system or not, right? So that's my perspective. I think that knowing outweighs the risk, um, and um, especially since, you know, the information is already likely available to those who want it. Yes, sir. With respect to, with respect to genetic testing and the results, how do you find someone who can uh, boil down those 48 pages into the, the few things that you really need to know about in a way that we can understand. Yeah, okay. Very, very great question. By the way, uh, I, you can use uh, Ancestry.com or 23andMe. I, as you can tell, I use the app called 20, um, MTHFR Support. And there's many different ways to do this, but um, I find that that's a really good way to, to, um, to search the, the, the genetic data because you can get a 58-page report from mthfr.support.com uh, if you upload your 23andMe raw data file into it. And, and our staff in my office can help people do that if they don't know how. Actually, the instructions how to do it are on my website. You don't even have to see me as a patient to, know, to get that information. Um, and then the key is your question says, how do you get that 58 page, you know, genetic report interpreted properly? So what I've done for my patients, um, is, is I've developed a 24 page narrative report that breaks down the report into kind of the top, the top, uh, 50 to 70 genes that we really have enough clinical data on to make clinical recommendations over. And, and they're, they're kind of like the, the low-hanging fruit, so to speak, with regards to genetic engineering principles for lifestyle medicine. So, so I, I go through that. It usually takes about two full hour-long sessions to get through the whole thing. They get a 24-page report. And then, and then basically specific recommendations, like what I learned. They, I always find something. You know, if you test enough, you're going to always find things. We, so I didn't do enough blood tests. I always find all kinds of stuff for patients. And, and that's good. That's what we want to. If we did all this testing and didn't find anything, you're like, no, that's good. I don't have any of those mutations. But, you know, what can I do to improve my health? You don't know. Uh, okay, looks like uh, everybody's ready to nod off, and, and uh, oh, 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 so we have, we have another couple questions, okay, just rate, just get, it, get uh, the attention of the mic guys, yes, yes sir. Yes, a number of years ago, um, Russell Blaylock, who's a neurosurgeon, came out with some concerns regarding different 
additives and stuff for, yes. uh, in our food. I think the primary one that comes to mind is having to do with free glutamic acid. Does that kind of dovetail into uh, what you're presenting? Yeah, I have, uh, I have Dr. Russell Blaylock's uh, textbooks that he wrote. The guy's a genius. He, he's in his, well into his 80s now. Both of his parents died of dementia associated with Parkinson's disease. Um, I suspect that that might have had something to do with him becoming a, a neuroscientist, a, neuro, a gifted neurosurgeon, but more importantly, uh, a, a gifted neuroscientist in terms of really understanding what's important. So he's one, he's one of the true you know, leaders in the field of neuroscience that would not hesitate in calling a spade a spade. You know, and, and uh, so I learned so much from him and I have a great respect for his perspectives. And yeah, so glutamate, uh, more, more especially in the forms of monosodium glutamate or, or the other analogs that are the, the, the flavor enhancers in many, many processed foods, those, are, those flavor enhancers are actually neurotransmitters. They don't just activate neurotransmitters. They are neurotransmitters that in the form of glutamate that, are the, that is the predominant excitatory neurotransmitter in the brain, in the nervous system, that actually destroys neurons. Okay, and so, so yeah, we have to greatly diminish our exposure to, that's why processed foods and junk food is so bad for us, fast foods because they're loaded with these type of flavor enhancers that just, wow, they taste so good, but it's just junk. You know, you can, make, you can make thin cardboard taste wonderful by just adding glutamate to it and a little sugar, you know, or, 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 or artificial sweetener. So just because something tastes good doesn't mean it's good for you, right? We all know that. Uh, so yeah, there's, there's, a, there's a lot of things that uh, Dr. Russell Blaylock uh, recommends and you know, here's another bonus point. He strongly recommends curcumin. Curcumin, which is the active ingredient in turmeric, or turmeric as some people pronounce it. Um, so, so getting the 95% standardized curcumin, which is 20 times more potent than turmeric is in its active ingredient, can powerfully improve brain function, lower inflammation, and Dr. Del Bredesen, in part because of that work, uh, recommends uh, up to 1,000 milligrams of 95% curcumin twice a day. Okay, so that's just a bonus before you go to bed tonight. Uh, may, well, don't take it tonight, but maybe. But I take, I take uh, at least 1,000 curcumin every day. Okay, and, it, and it's just one of the many things that I do to enhance my, uh, or limit risk associated with cognitive decline, which I know I have because my grandfather died with Alzheimer's. I'm treating my uncle right now who has Alzheimer's, and I know I'm on the road for that if I am not careful. So I'm, I'm paying attention to that. Are you going to cover fructose tomorrow? Oh, yes. Tomorrow we will address fructose and sugar uh, as well. So, so what's that? Yeah, yeah, so, so the, there's all kinds of things that we're going to cover. Yeah, so come tomorrow at 2.30, come enjoy the potluck. At, what time is the potluck? Huh? Sometime at 12.30 or after church. And uh, uh, even if you don't come to church, come to potluck. And then come to the program, and you'll learn a lot. God bless. Good night.